Hello, my name is Martin Curley, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the uh, Summer 2020 uh, Digital Academy Forum. Uh, today we're going to talk about the digital responses to COVID-19 from the HSE and a lot of our partners. Uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of my team, uh, which consists of myself, uh, Ross Cullen, Lorraine Smith, and, and Des O'Toole, who has joined us recently. So, by setting, or in terms of setting some context, we have a digital health roadmap for Ireland. And unfortunately, we were identified as a European laggard by the OECD uh, report, our health in the 21st century. But our ambition is within five to seven years, we want to become a digital leader and, and uh, accomplish that transformation from being a European laggard in digital health. It's fair to say that we are ranked as a level one maturity organization. But we believe over the period of the three, the most intense period of response to COVID-19, about a three month period, we actually achieved a couple of years worth of progress. So we've moved from a level one to a level two um, maturity organization on the digital health roadmap. Now our overarching digital health strategy is something we call stay left, shift left, which is very aligned with the government strategy called Slaunch Care. And our goal is first to keep well people well in their homes, or if you happen to have a chronic condition that you can be best uh, managed uh, from home using a virtual ward concept. Shift left is about moving people, finding technology interventions, digital technology interventions, that move a person as quickly as possible from an acute setting to a community setting and into a home care setting. And all the time as we seek out and deploy these digital health innovations, we're looking to reduce the cost of care, improve the quality of care, improve quality of life, and improve the clinician experience. And over the next several slides, I'll give you examples of how we've been able to do that. But first, let's talk about um, the concept of Big Bang Disruption introduced in a recent book by Larry Downs and Paul Nunes. And essentially it means compressing the normal adoption cycle that was you know, classified by Everett Rogers and then popularized uh, by Jeffrey Moore and compressing the adoption to a very intense period of time. And a lot through necessity, we've been able to accomplish some of these Big Bang disruptions. Um, this is a, a view of our digital transformation a pipeline, you know, pre-COVID. We just kind of had a number, we had lots of ideas, but we just had a couple of pro pro pilots or projects in, in motion. Now, this is what it looked like uh, post-COVID-19. Uh, we had a lot more proof of concepts in, in train. We had a number of demonstrators and we had seven solutions that were really adopted in a, a big buying uh, fashion and have been adding a lot of value and have really helped with Ireland's response to digital response to COVID-19. At the start of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Ireland, we opened a solutions portal where anybody could come in and submit an idea or a solution and we received no more than 100 um, offerings that we, we then evaluated. Uh, probably the most impressive um, solution that we were able to do, deploy uh, was a remote management solution for COVID-19. Uh, based on the WHO report uh, on COVID-19 in Wuhan, uh, it seemed that oxygen saturation levels were the key thing that would deteriorate uh, first uh, when as COVID-19 symptoms developed. So working with patient to empower the digital hub, we were able to develop or co-develop uh, an app that could be prescribed to patients together with a Bluetooth enabled pulse oximeter. And if the um, oxygen saturation level um, went below 93%, a text and a phone call was made, an automated phone call was made to the treating consultant so a further decision could be made whether to hospitalize a patient or whether they could remain in their homes. Um, at the height of the COVID crisis, we had more than a thousand patients being, monitoring, being monitored using this solution. Uh, and overall, we had about 29 institutes or hospitals in the country prescribing the solution. But it, so that was very much sort of, you know, big bang. Typically, such a deployment would it cost or would take at least a minimum of, of a year, if not longer. 
put into this, this picture here, uh, I I'm demonstrating the app and uh, the pulse oximeter working together. And just a week before I was able to demonstrate this in public, the technology didn't exist. And then after a week and a half development, following on from this picture, we actually first are started first prescribing this solution. So it was very agile approach and we had big bang um, adoption over a matter of, week, matter of weeks, we had more than 20 hospitals prescribing this solution. It saved a lot of bed capacity um, in, in Ireland, freeing up lots of beds for patients with more serious uh, COVID-19 symptoms. And it also had better quality of life and an equal standard of care uh, to patients uh, because they were uh, in their own homes, but they were receiving hospital grade sort of monitoring. Um, how the app worked very simply on a number of times a day, the patient would be um, prompted to record their oxygen saturation level, their temperature and subjective information. And uh, as I said, if a saturation level dropped below 93%, then an alert was made to the treating clinician and a decision could be made on, on, on what to do. Um, this is an example of the Big Bang disruption and uh, all of these sites were up and running in the space of you know two to four weeks, which was you know, remarkable considering it would normally take at least a year to have this uh, level of a, of a rollout. A very simple innovation, but a very effective one was the use of non-contact uh, thermometers. This is a trimedical tri-temp and much safer for staff and for patients in that there's no physical contact between the thermometer and the patient. Another attractive, uh, very attractive feature of this is the cost of ownership of these non-contact infrared thermometers was a fifth of the cost of the conventional thermometers that were used in, in hospitals. And again, early in the COVID crisis, we procured 10,000 of these and they have been deployed to nursing homes, to you know, public health nurses, acute hospitals, and it just shows how something very simple can be effective. And again, we had big bang disruption, the deployment of um, a technology uh, like this normally would take you know, months, if not years, and we accomplished the, the, the adoption of 10,000 units uh, in the space of about four weeks. Another technology that was adopted and again, this was developed in a very agile fashion. We'd been working with uh, Red Zinc uh, to um, test the technology, which would allow uh, an ambulance crew at the scene of a, an accident uh, have a secure two-way communication with somebody back in the A&E to get advice. And this technology was repurposed in about a week and a half to enable a healthcare professional have a secure video conference consultation with a patient simply by just sending them, sending them a link to their phone. The patient presses the link and up starts uh, this secure two-way communication. Um, we had very quickly 300 mental health professionals across the country using this and St. James Hospital, uh, the largest acute hospital in the country ramped very quickly and that's where we actually did our initial testing. Um, similarly, Ireland didn't have um, a track record of where GPs were using telemedicine uh, or tele video consultations with patients. And we worked two with two providers, Wellola and Nua Health. And in the space of 48 hours, both of these vendors had spun up a GP remote communication portal. And then once we announced it working with the Irish College of General, General Practitioners, uh, we were able to, um, uh, or we, what we witnessed was 600 uh, clinics and consultants joining each of those platforms uh, within 48 hours. So it's another example of big bang disruption. Uh, we, uh, without COVID-19, uh, we would likely not have seen uh, such sort of a big bang uh, adoption. And today it's become the norm uh, rather than the exception to have video consultations. Um, an innovation that happened simply by joining the dots was actually a legislation uh, innovation where secretary, secondary legislation was introduced to allow the prescriptions uh, to be transferred electronically. Up to this, it was possible, but it wasn't legally um, possible for pharmacists to dispense uh, electronic prescriptions. So our, um, the Department of Health Minister, uh, Simon Harris, signed this into law. And we began this innovation by simply pulling the Irish College of General Practitioners together, the Irish Pharmacy, 
uh, union, one of them, the big vendors in the market, Glen William, uh, the HSC and the Department of Health, and we got agreement on a, a way forward. And what we saw was, you know, big bang adoption. This is a chart showing sort of pharmacy uh, users and uh, GP users. And uh, most of the GPs in the country have now adopted this service. And almost all of the pharmacies, you know, 2,240 uh, ha have adopted it. This is just a chart of showing the big bang adoption. Again, this pattern of going from almost zero uh, to widespread adoption happening in 20, in 48 hours. So on day one, when this the legislation came into law, there were 79 uh, messages sent. Or day two, there were 298 prescriptions transferred electronically. But by day three, uh, there was over 20,000 prescriptions tr uh, transferred electronically. So it's a really good example of big bang adoption. Uh, another solution that was developed was a clinical tool for respiratory care of COVID-19 patients. And this was a great collaboration between respiratory consultants and S3, a Dublin-based uh, software development uh, house. And uh, what they did was built a uh, an application based around uh, something called the COVID Critical Care Index or the CCCI. And this allowed uh, either experienced respiratory consultants or non-experienced uh, consultants or, um, to basically manage uh, patients who are in the A&E or in the COVID wards. And it allowed actually predict and potentially show which patients would actually need uh, ICU care or respiratory respirator um, care and we went from we, with this product uh, S3 were able to build a medical grade device which was approved by the HPRA in Ireland and deployed in the space of four to six weeks. Another innovation that we introduced which hasn't yet been broadly adopted is a technology called RespiraSense from a company called PMD Solutions. And this basically uh, is a device that is mounted uh, just below the rib cage and it wirelessly transmits via Bluetooth the patient's respiration rate. Uh, this again was much safer for our staff and better for patients in that uh, staff didn't have to come close in the proximity of patients to actually measure their respiration rate. So uh, the national early warning score, the new score could be calculated. We have this deployed in Bowman Hospital in Dublin and in Cork University Hospital. And we're currently working to build a business case for a broader Big Bang adoption. Uh, a technology that has been very useful in, in terms of monitoring staff's temperatures and um, visitor um, temperatures to nursing homes and to hospitals is what we call a, a thermo kiosk. Uh, we've run an early pilot uh, with these devices in a number of nursing homes and um, in, in a couple of acute hospitals. And it has proved very effective and you know, has been welcomed by staff and visitors alike and can detect if a person uh, coming into, um, say, a nursing home has a high temperature or not. We classify these as clinical support tools and not as uh, medical devices. And when they're used, we have a flow chart like shown on the right here, uh, which, um, basically advises if the clinical support device registers a high temperature then there's a flow path where a nurse will actually uh, take the person's temperature with a certified uh, thermometer. Uh, a pilot that has been running pre-COVID but also saw some spotlight uh, during COVID was the use of mobile x-ray machines so bringing a patient uh, or bringing the x-ray machine to the patient rather than actually having to have the patient go to the hospital where there's risk of contamination with COVID-19 and also so, you know, bottleneck and backlog uh, for, for x-rays. So uh, this proved uh, you know, quite effective during the COVID-19 period and uh, about 90% of the patients didn't require further transfer to a uh, hospital. So um, this is technology where we expect to see some big bang adoption in the not too distant future. <clears throat> Another novel technology that was introduced uh, was uh, ultraviolet cleaning with a company called Acara. And again, in terms of agility, we went from a, a drawing board um, discussion with Connor McKinn, the CEO of Acara, uh, to a working prototype in less than 48 hours. And the picture here shows the first prototype of this device. 
Uh, we're now testing this in the Midlands General Hospital in Tullamore and um, some preliminary data shows it's very promising in, in not just killing COVID-19, but also superbugs like MRSA. Uh, we're completing trials or running trials in Tullamore and we hope the reports will, the uh, microbiology reports will provide compelling evidence for the broad or big bang adoption of ultraviolet cleaning. Uh, on the fringes of our innovation portfolio, we were also working with a drone company called MANA and we were able to demonstrate closed loop um, ordering and uh, delivery of medicine or prescription medicine. And how this essentially worked, a doctor would have a video consultation with a cocooning, cocooning person, uh, would then write a prescription electronically, send it to the pharmacy. The pharmacy would dispense it and then the um, a uh, prescription will be delivered by drone to the person's house. And we uh, will continue to evaluate and look at how this might be effective solution for waves of um, COVID that might, might come again. Uh, lastly, to mention the HSE invested heavily in a contact uh, tracing app. This one just went live in the last week or so. And uh, remarkable figures almost are 1,000 or 1, 200,000 people downloaded it in the first uh, 48 hours or so. And this again is another example of uh, Big Bang adoption. So I'll finish with a quote from Ilya Prijanin, uh, the digital transformation team and its partners in the ecosystem. We're a relatively small part of the overall HSE organization, but what we continuously observed is in an unstable complex system, small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. Uh, we're very pleased with the progress that we've made over the last uh, three months or so. We believe we've achieved two to three years worth of progress in the space of two to three months. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to innovate, do proof of concepts and demonstrators and look for the broad deployment of other technologies uh, that we are currently experimenting with. So thank you for your attention. Bear that in mind as well. We have reduced capacity in the system because of the need for distancing and infection control measures. Um, and really we have to, you know, I suppose adjust and amend all of our patient and staff flow pathways. Uh, we also have staffing challenges, so we still have staff who have been redeployed to COVID, so to testing uh, as one example. Um, and also we have staff that are just really tired, so we have staff that have worked continuously and who now need to take breaks. Um, and we need, we know that we kind of could potentially end up back in the position where staff need to isolate, and uh, that has been a massive challenge for the system. We also know that we need to maintain people's skills. So where people have been trained to do more in critical care or something else, contact tracing, that we maintain those skills in the event that another surge happens. We have public expectation. Uh, so we were on the crest of a wave there for a while with you know, everybody thinking the HSE was great. And I'd love to think that would continue, but I'm sure that uh, you know, we'll start to get the negative messaging back and we can see it coming back a bit already in terms of people whose care has been, delay care has been delayed or appointments canceled or whatever. And then obviously there's the cost implications. So we have spent a fortune. Uh, we've been busy spending the nation's money for the past few months and that can't continue. Uh, we have to be accountable for the expenditure. We have to show that there's been impact uh, and we have to make clear business cases now for any additional expenditure. Um, and that's something that I suppose we have to keep an eye on as well. So really, you know, just to kind of to start wrapping up in terms of the way forward, you know, where are we going? Um, and what are the priorities for us? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work going on now already around winter planning. We have to have the bones of a winter plan uh, pulled together by the end of July, which is considerably earlier than what we would have done in the past few years. But the big ticket things that we're looking at relate to telehealth. So in terms of the ongoing and further development of solutions that can support service delivery, uh, there's a huge amount of evidence out there. Um, and I know there's some very innovative work that's gone on, uh, I suppose, from your own perspectives. Uh, but really, we have to continue to push forward on standing up solutions that we know can make a difference. Um, sometimes it feels a bit like we're jumping off a, a cliff in terms of these solutions, but certainly the evidence during COVID would suggest that we have to go with them. Uh, and really telehealth is, is something uh, that is critical uh, to the future of service delivery. In terms of older person services, you know, we have our chronic, we have our integrated program for older persons uh, and our integrated program for chronic disease management. We're doing a lot of work uh, on those in terms of actually 
being able to increase hospital avoidance measures, uh, looking at how we can reduce attendances. Uh, we know already that the attendances of people aged over 75 have exceeded last year's. Uh, so we're not in the space anymore thinking that people aren't attending. We have more people attending uh, and we have to manage that and come up with other pathways for older people and people with chronic disease in particular. Looking at how we can support primary care and general practice, both in terms of their actual manpower and also access to diagnostics and access to specialist opinion, which again can be remote. Uh, so the use of telehealth there, but we really need to have specialists reaching out to GPs to reduce the need for people to be referred into hospitals for specialist opinion. Um, also having as both technology enabled communication, looking at how we can monitor people at home uh, without bringing them into hospitals and the ongoing development of community health, ne health networks. Also then in terms of our acute hospital care, just again, reducing uh, attendance, looking at the flow. So from our ED into our acute medical assessment units, our acute surgical assessment units, uh, and ensuring that we have continued flow through our hospital and then uh, continued, I suppose, and timely discharge. So reducing our delayed transfers of care. And then finally, the whole need to continue uh, testing. Uh, so we've got to ensure that our testing capacity remains in place. There's actually more of a demand coming on the system now, uh, as there's lots of discussion around airports and arrivals and all sorts of things, and we, we don't quite know where that's going to end up. But there will be, a, I suppose, a need for effective testing for really for, for this year, next year, and, and beyond, possibly. Um, so testing has been a massive additional service that's been developed uh, at a pace, really, and at a scale in the last couple of months. So I think that's yeah, that's kind of the, the last slide for me. Um, so it's a very quick whistle-stop tour through the response from a service perspective uh, over the past few months, uh, and hopefully it gives you an insight into what we've been doing. Thank you, Anne. That was really brilliant, and it's it's kind of you know awe-inspiring when you see actually every sort of strand of it. We can get a little bit sort of you know focused in telehealth, but when you look at all the other areas that uh, deliver, really, really impressive. I, I was talking to person McKinsey Consulting yesterday based in the UK, Germany, he said, how did Ireland get this so right compared to what's happened in, in, in the UK? So okay. thanks very much, Anne. We really appreciate no you. Problem. No problem. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and another area where Ireland has got it right is in the contact tracing app. And we're delighted to have Fran Thompson, who's our CIO and who has very much led Telehand and the Office of CIO response in a very hands-on fashion during the COVID period. So over to you, Fran. Uh, thanks, Martin. Thank you. Um, okay, so you should be able to see that now. Just loading now, yeah? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I, I think I think Anne's introduction there was was very helpful because I think you know for us I suppose the challenge and we are one of the enabling work streams, and the challenge was very simple I suppose was just to just to enable digital for COVID. Okay, nice simple you know straightforward challenge. Okay, and that we have to do everything now, uh, um, you know, so much faster, so much nimbler, and so much quicker than we've ever done before. Um, so one of the things that we tried to do is say like. And on the left hand side in the screen is a very busy screen and I'll take people through maybe some of just the highlights uh, that we want to try and do is on the left hand side we think there was the pathway of care for COVID that covered you know patient pathway of care that covered you know starting from the call triage screening testing the labs critical care and the contact tracing and our challenge in some ways was saying is how do we enable that integrated uh, flow so that the patient is at the center and that it's not the technology or not the organization or not the the institution that you're in that's at the center um and what we looked at it to try and do is say look there is there are we the first thing we should be trying to do is utilize as many of our existing assets as possible um, and what assets do we have that we can utilize because the speed of delivery will be so much faster and the second thing was, what are the things where we have to buy them? How can we buy them quickly, efficiently, and effectively? Um, and we liaised with our friends in procurement, and we also liaised with um, Department of Health and with uh, OGCIO Deeper to make sure that there would be a very fast approval process. 
and both of those stakeholders came on board and we organized that we'd have a weekly meeting and that it would be fairly quick to get things approved so people will know from the past it has taken us a long time sometimes to get to get things approved um we were i suppose very much on a war footing so we stopped a lot of projects that were going on and we concentrated on these projects that were here in order to deliver the model of care end to end so starting, I suppose, we you know, utilize HealthLink, which is really, you know, th th that's our platform for getting data from our GPs through and into uh, 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 our acute hospitals and back out again, okay? Um, and that platform really came into its own for this, because before that, it had been just seen as a GP platform or a platform that was used by much smaller number of people. But 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 the investments that were made in the past really came into their their own here. And the team that were there is a very small team, but they worked night and day to deliver uh, on the functionality that was required. They're also the same team that 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 look after the IHI and the IHI played a fairly pivotal role in this because it allowed us to see one patient rather than have them multiple multiple repeats of the same patient all the way through so when we look at the the the, the flow um HealthLink was our enabler swift q was where we were using we had we had to go out and uh, 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 sort of procure that uh, was widely adopted as our referrals and appointment system for COVID related uh, work. Um, and we linked that in with um, IHI, we linked it in with the geolocation, so we could actually automate and support the um, people who are getting uh, appointments to go for swabbing. Um, the uh, 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 prescriptions, as Martin has already spoken about, is the expansion of health mail functionality to allow for the electronic transfer of prescriptions. That has been a huge challenge because we think about it at the height of COVID, people couldn't go and get the repeat prescriptions. So the best they could do is get to a G, get, get to a pharmacy, um, but they couldn't go to a GP. So how do we enable the GP to send the pharmacy a prescription? And then most pharmacies then would allow would accept that, and there are some legal constraints around that which had to be overcome, and the department supported us in doing that. In the early days, I think Anne was talking about HSE Live, which you were talking about through, and, and I was was involved uh, quite a bit in HSE Live. So when this started off, we were expecting to see maybe a, you know a thousand calls a day coming into our HSE Live, and HSE Live was scaled to handle about three to four hundred calls a day max um and once this broke the number of calls that came into hse live were absolutely astronomical um we were getting 11 12 13 000 a day it peaked at 126 000 calls in one day and when it was getting to that sort of we said, look, there's no way that the HSE can manage this process, both internally on our exchanges, which we were doing, and we we're routing calls all around the place using our own network to do so in Kells and in RD and other places. Um, we had another call center here in Stevens as well. So we said, look, we need to we we need to think of a different way of doing this. We need to have virtually a limitless exchange. So we turned to AWS and we asked them and worked with them to actually put in a an exchange in the cloud that would facilitate us to take and answer calls anywhere in the country, either in our facilities or somebody else's facilities. And that proved to be really successful. Um, we also stuck in a bot so that and, and part of the part of the challenge we had as well is how do we take pressure off the call centers? Because no matter how many people we drew at the call centers, there were more calls than we had people for. So we put in a bot and we put in other technology to try and support people with self-help and self-reliance to actually, uh, you know, to, to, to answer the questions they wanted. We really beefed up the um, the, the, the HSE web pages around COVID and, and worked with, with the teams around that. Um, the other challenge that we had was a testing facility. So we had to stand up testing facilities and we had to make sure, and these were in remote places, uh, uh, i.e. Not, not on a HSE uh, site. Some, like as people would know, were in, were in Croke Park. There were others on a boat on the, in the, uh, on the Liffey. There were others in Cork, Limerick. You name it, we were standing up locations. And those locations had to be tech-enabled to allow people to, you know, who had been booked in from SwiftQ to come into our facility to have their swab taken um, and then for that swab to be labelled and sent on to the labs. 
and all that that had to be done without have us having any fixed technology to support that. So it was all done utilizing, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, web technology. We also utilized a huge amount of um, MiFi's and Wi-Fi's that attached people back to the HSE, and some of them were directly onto raw internet. Um, and you know, these were very mobile. Uh, stations that were being set up and manned by people who this wasn't their job. Their job was working in community care. Their job was working in an acute hospital, and they were re relocated to some of these swabbing centres. Um, the swabs then had to go to the labs, and we had to beef up all of our labs. We had to stand uh, and, and support NVRL around the, around standing up those labs, around the integration of that data back in to the COVID tracker system, which we'll which we'll cover in a minute. Okay. Um, and we had to make sure that all that data flowed so that the data followed the patient, which was the really critical part of that. Um, some of the other pieces you'll see there in red were around the facilities that had to be stood up and uh, and engaged with. So including the, the COVID-19 facilities, you know, the, 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 the intermediate care and, and the self-isolation facilities, some which we used, some which we didn't use, but they were all stood up from an IT perspective and fully mobilised. Um, a huge amount of work went on with the private hospitals to ensure that even though we didn't use an awful lot of the, the, the functionality, but we had to ensure that we could send patients patients and their data to the private hospitals. Um, and then we also had to, um, you know, support clinical telehealth, remote secure video consultations, both in our institutions and at people's homes. So we, you know, in reality, we sent both clinical and admin people, you know, eight or 9,000 people home. And we had to facilitate all that within 48, you know, 50 hours so that everybody could actually work from home the same as if they're working in the office. Um, and we also deployed a PCRS portal, okay, which will allow clinicians visibility to dispense medicines in a number of, of institutions. And the last piece on this screen, I know it's very busy, Ricky, was the COVID care tracker. And the COVID care tracker was really our solution. Uh, it's developed in Microsoft Dynamics that allowed us to manage all of that data, bring all of that data together and allowed our contact tracing teams to manage and see the data for an individual. And what's not on this slide, because uh, it was sort of developed after the slide, is the app. Um, so and that was really uh, to allow people to, because one of the one of the challenges with contact tracing is, you know, if somebody can remember, and, and and I never can anyway, who were you with ten days ago? Who were you with nine days ago? Who was within two meters of you five minutes for 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 fifteen minutes? 10 days ago. It's a real challenge. Most people will struggle. Some will be brilliant and they'll know exactly who it was, but a lot of people will struggle around that space. And the app was really developed to enable us to utilize mobile technology to support some of that process. Um, and as, as people know from the news, it's been uh, you know a, a, a reasonably good success. There's about 1.2 million people have downloaded the app, okay, and we already have uh, a, a number of cases uh, which came through the app, and some which would not have been known to our contact tracers because the app picked them up, and those people will be sent for testing, and we'll know them whether they were positive or not, and that really does give us a, a validation of it. Um, and last, I know it means least in the app. Um, it is interesting because we, you know, as Anne said, we're spending a fortune. I think we've spent about 15 million uh, in ICT um, to date uh, on all on all of this, which is which is relatively uh, small. We have utilised our own people hugely, um, and we have also brought in externals as well. So I'll quickly go through uh, and, and maybe you know uh, 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 the next slide fairly quickly. I won't spend a really huge, huge amount of time on it. Part of the learning we have here, and some of this we had beforehand, was look we have about it, we have eight strategic goals that we're trying to work through, and you'll see, you know, from the slide beforehand where some of these played in. And I mean, like there really is putting the patient at the centre, and how do we empower citizen-centric healthcare? In order to do that, we've got to develop our own organisation. We've got to stabilise our existing platform. As most people know, we have hundreds, we have thousands of applications uh, uh, within the organisation. We have to accelerate the digitisation of the health service right across the whole service. Data insight uh, 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 is really key. We have to use data to make decisions in our organization and to bring all these systems together, we've got to integrate across all of our IT systems. 
And last but no means least, we need to build a common digital workplace for all of our staff across the health service so that it looks and feels the same. So as people are moving from facility to facility or location to location, you know, there's a common thread all the way through. Um, and what we've done here is then is just looking and saying like, here are the sort of areas that we know, I'm not going to go through through all of these, that will really enable how we do that going forward, okay? And a lot of this is taken from the learning of uh, uh, COVID. So I'll just, I'll just pick two or three of them. So if you tell me, like, on the right-hand side there, cloud adoption. One of the huge um, resilience and one of the huge benefits we've had with, with with deploying on the cloud is it didn't matter where somebody was getting care whether it was in a hse facility whether it was uh, you know in in croke park or whether it was on the side of the road once we had access to the cloud we could provide people with a really good set of data and information um which is really really important the middle one there, I think, which has been really, you know, helpful to us, and, and Martin covered some of that in his introduction, okay, and that is digital innovation, because one of the things we need to do is lots and lots of people come knocking on the door. We need to validate and prove and align the digital innovation with the organization's needs and its capacity to deliver, and that's what Martin and his team are doing at the moment. Um, on the right hand side around identity management A to I, I mean, one of the real challenges we've had all the way through is how do you identify a patient? How do you identify common citizens? How do you identify locations? How do you identify clinicians that are, that are supporting us? And, you know, we have, our, we have our IHI, we have our health identifiers index, and we utilize that hugely through COVID. And that really gave us some great data insights because we could uniquely identify patients, follow them through their journey of care. And a lot of the stats that you saw that came out from Yvonne's team, Yvonne Goff's team, you know, they all came from being able to identify single people, single locations, okay? And then the remote working, which I covered sort of briefly beforehand, that's a huge challenge because we had to send home, like, like most organizations, um, a lot of their people, but we had to send them home, I suppose, it's the numbers. We sent eight or 10,000 people home and had, they had to be able to function and continue to work from home. And sometimes the technology set that they're working on back in the office was fairly challenging and you know, wouldn't actually facilitate remote working. So we had to think of so, some fairly innovative ways of how we did that. And last but not least, least on the top, I mean, a service desk and it's sort of much forgotten about. I mean, the, the increase in calls, so the ICT service desk was about 50%. So we had to stand that up and people were expecting, you know, immediate response and immediate support, far more than when they were in the office. Um, if I look at, say, where we go in the future, okay, and I'm again using this as a, you know, uh, as, as a lens that we're trying to do around these eight, 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 eight goals, okay, I mean, you know, like most strategies, there's a bit of motherhood and apple pie in it, okay, uh, and like most visions there is too. But if you, but but really around the key piece that is, is integrated inf information that enables technology supports to deliver care, and that's the really important thing here, okay. Now what we've done is that for each of these goals, we have, and I let you read them as as, as I flick through them. But we have a basic set like what are we trying to achieve here? What are the key things? And the and the clue is in the name, okay. You know, citizen centric health care. Okay, putting the citizen at the centre. Okay, what do we need to do to deliver that in our organisation? And that's refocus our own operating model on the modernisation and you know, through the organisation of, of, of Slauncher Care, because that's where the organisation is heading, and we need to line up with that. We also recognise that technology doesn't stand still. So you know, all the time there are massive modernisation, massive security issues that go on, stabilising platforms. And when you have 16 or 1700 platforms out there, it is a continuous job. And we need to you know, find ways to bring all of our systems up to a level where we can, where we can just keep them running and keep them managing. Um, the focus where most people uh, go is is on accelerating digitization of the health service because that's the, that's where the value piece is and that's really important that we actually uh, start delivering on that because that's the piece that actually enables the business to work and work really effectively okay um the insight i spoke about i mean we need to become a data driven organization one of the things through COVID was because we could we, we could provide data to people to make real-time decisions on a daily basis 
right? You know, we made a lot of the right decisions. We got some things wrong, absolutely, but we made a lot of right decisions because we had the data and we could see the trends and we could see the analytics and people and, and people who are smart and understand the business were able to make those right decisions. That integration across the system, absolutely key, as, as, as I've covered before, okay? And finally then, you know, establishing that foundation to have a digital workplace. We need to provide people with a constant, connected employee experience so that it's the same no matter where they are. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for us going forward is how do you, how do you make this happen? How do you, how do you change the organization? I'll just flick through the slides again fairly quickly. Um, and what you'll see, just that again, is another busy slide because we're trying to get a, a lot into it, um, is that we're utilizing our goals and saying like, we our delivery is, is fairly goal focused and it comes back to those goals, right? Hey? Um, and you know, we need to tune our organization to, to land up to the operating model. I'm looking at the top, top of the screen now around developing the IT organization. Um, one of the lessons we would have learned from COVID and from and beforehand, unless the ICT organization is in aligned with the business, you know, it, it will go out of sync and people then don't know where to go for support. Um, as I come down the right hand side again, I won't go through every, every part of that. I'll make the slides available, Martin, and you can send them around to people if that if that's okay. Please. Um, um, but I mean, like when you look at, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll pick ones I haven't sort of touched on before, but we look at say cybersecurity, cybersecurity for all organizations is a substantial challenge, a bigger challenge when we're, when we're dealing with more and more locations. And if you think about it, we're now not dealing with the 2000 locations we normally dealt with. We're dealing with 10,000 locations because we've 8,000 people or, or so who are now working at home or remotely. Um, so the number of locations we have, the number of systems we have, the and, and the constant moving is a huge challenge around that. Um, in in putting together uh, the, 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 the next uh, a, a section or okay, around the COVID back to business, um, it's been called also things, you know, HSE recovery plan, the continuity plan, or okay. Um, we spoke to the business, like what are the things that you've learned from COVID that you would really, really want to do and want to have quickly and effectively, especially with winter coming, um, were things that we aren't doing today. And, and the sort of systems that people were talking about is an enterprise schedule. We, we, need to be able to enter, we need to be able to schedule, especially in community. We need to have a, a view of national waiting lists. One of the real challenges we know coming up is home helps. How do we enable people to be, to be provided care at home? Right, um, and it, it, it probably going to be on a statutory basis shortly. So we need to have a really good home help system. Residential care. One of the real challenges around some of the early days of COVID was we didn't know who was where. Okay, in our own residential care settings, right? what care they were getting, why they were there. So that, really important. Electronic discharge. How do we how do we speed up the integration between um, our acute facilities and particularly our community and GPs. Um, video conferencing we've spoken about, shared care record, because in actual fact, if you think about it, as people are now not working in institutions, they need to be able to, there is no access to one record. They need to be able to share that record and the care that they're getting is going to be across multiple organisations. And part of our challenge then is that when you look at all the other national digital solutions that are being planned, it's how do we now prioritise these in a COVID world, to to ensure that we can we can deliver for uh, 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 our frontline staff, and then we have a a myriad of new solutions which are all really important. Okay, that also need to be looked at, and some of them add huge value. Like say the robotic process automation, okay, the IIS and analytics for clinical engagement. So some of those solutions are really really crucial and required. Um, as I move across to the left hand side, um, you know, there are some enable, enablers that are really required here. So Windows 10 and our AD. So we need to get everybody onto, onto Windows 10. We need to get everybody onto a single na national directory. Um, we have a legacy from the old health boards that is still with us today of having lots and lots of uh, 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 active directories. I cover the identity management and health linker, okay? And last but no means least, we developed that, you know, are, are we really sort of continued development of, of the concept of a data lake in which we extended that to all, as many assists as we can, all of our COVID information is coming out of our data lake and then we're visualizing that on top of it. Um, 
last slide from here, okay, a couple of key messages and which I provided to people before, okay. People look at this as that's an ICT challenge. It's actually not. ICT, if this is an ICT challenge, we will fail. This is a business transformation challenge, which ICT plays a part on. Everything that we do going forward, we really must, and why we always say it before, we must put a patient at the center of how we deliver ICT care. 70% um, of our existing resources are keeping the lights on and, and, and supporting those existing solutions. And the key enablers for us, and they are really important, that you know, we talk about IHI, um, so, so you know, that is what actually puts the patient at the center. From a from a from, from an identity purpose, and we need to look at cloud as a matter of course. As I said earlier on, you know we cannot and we will n never be able to compete with cloud. And 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 I firmly believe that anybody who thinks that their data is safer, you know, in our data centers than on one of the the the, the big cloud providers, probably needs to look at the big cloud providers. Okay, and, and and have a think about it. Okay, um, and IHE is you know standards need to be utilised as a as the norm for integrating our solutions um, uh, uh, across all of our solutions, uh, integrating solutions across all of the domain. Um, the, the other thing I, I think Anne had covered it. Okay, is that, I mean when we started off, we were think, thinking there would be a COVID service and a non-COVID service. At the end of the day, okay, um, there's just going to be a post-COVID service, and we must accommodate them in tandem. Um, last last two points is that the national solutions, while really hard to deliver, when they are delivered successfully, they give fantastic long-term benefit right across the whole of the domain. But that they need to be done, but not at the expense of local and local systems, which are critical to, to manage the business, but they must be done in a standardized way. Um, we spoke about data and information, key to supporting services, okay? And in, in order for this to happen in, in, in an, in an organised way, we as a HSE and as a health service need to prioritise okay, what we want to deliver and in what order. Okay? And last but no means least is that we need to move to a much more agile environment and, and, and people need to expect that not everything gets delivered in day one and that there's a significant optimization part around any project. That's me, Martin. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Fran. That was, I think, you know, uh, a, a really good broad view of everything that the opposite CIO did in response to COVID-19. And that coupled with what, what Anne presented, I think we really have a very 360 degree view of how Ireland was able to respond so efficiently and effectively to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So thanks again, Fran. Did you want me to take questions or not, Martin? Or do you, are you are you doing that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, the time pushed, Fran. So fine, that's okay. No, I was only just offering it. That's okay. What we can do is we can ask people if they have specific questions, if they could actually document them uh, on WebEx, and we'll get them to to Fran and Anne and other speakers for, for a response. And that's probably a learning for the next uh, the next webcast that we do. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Eamon Costello. Uh, our CEO of Patient Empower, and uh, Eamon has worked very closely with uh, the HSC, the CIO Digital Transformation Team, and particularly with Lorraine Smith, in terms of moving very quickly to go from a simple concept. This began with a, a three-way, a two-way conversation with Fran, Eamon, and myself, and it became actually a system that was deployed to almost 30 sites across the, the country. So, uh, Eamon, I'll hand over to you, and if it's possible to do it in 10 minutes, uh, I think we'd appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I can cut it back by a few minutes. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today uh, about our co experiences in remote monitoring in COVID-19, uh, which is very much in keeping with the aims that you've outlined, Martin, of slowing to care and shifting care left into the community and the home. Um, so Patient Empower is a digital healthcare company with as much emphasis on the word healthcare is digital. We have a full-time chief scientific officer with 30 years experience in evidence-based medicine and clinical trials. We have a chief medical officer providing us with clinical guidance. And from our inception, we've always partnered with researchers and academic hospitals in building evidence in our solutions. Um, so one partnership pre-COVID-19 that's just worth highlighting is a deployment we have with NYU Langone uh, Lung Transplant Center. So we help them transform their care pathway 
most chronic lung disease patients are brought back on identical schedules because the clinicians don't have visibility if they're doing okay. With NYU, our platform facilitates the pulmonary function tests and other measures to be recorded at home. And this allows them to virtually triage their patients and determine who is doing well and doesn't need to come back to the hospital. But it also allows them to intervene early with those that are displaying signs of an exacerbation or a potential hospitalization. So pre-COVID-19, this was allowing them to see patients 67% less than comparable lung programs. So the day before Ireland's first COVID-19 uh, case, the WHO released its final report on its mission to China. It laid out objective criteria for classifying the disease severity. And after studying the report and seeing how hospitals in Northern Italy became overwhelmed, we realized our respiratory solution could help the Irish healthcare system to manage patients outside of the hospital. So as Martin mentioned, we worked closely um, with, with Martin and Lorraine and the Digital Transformation Group and with Fran and the OCIO. Um, and really, we got traction with this uh, straight away. Um, with our existing background working with leading lung physicians around Ireland, um, we really got the backing of the medical community who saw the value in, in how this could be deployed. And in a matter of weeks, as Martin mentioned and showed this slide earlier, we were got deployed in uh, around 20 hospitals around the country, but then also many more um, community settings. Um, and one or two to note would be the likes of the homeless charities in managing very vulnerable COVID-19 patients, and also in some of the respiratory primary care hubs, um, which was used to help detect silent hypoxia associated with COVID-19. The solution is a C-marked software medical device, which is a patient-facing app and a clinical monitoring portal. The patient-facing app connects via Bluetooth to a clinical-grade pulse oximeter to measure the blood oxygen level, one of the key markers identifying the severity and progression of COVID-19. Um, another such marker would be the, the respiratory rate, and I know Miles from PMD is presenting on this later on. It also collects uh, temperature, symptoms, and other data, which was helping the clinicians to manage the disease. The clinical portal allows staff to review the data and also provides automated telephone and SMS alerts if a patient's blood oxygen declines to a level indicating disease progression. So why was this a good idea? So primarily, of course, it was about preserving hospital capacity. Many patients who were very ill with COVID-19 could be discharged and monitored from home. And without this solution, they would not have been possible due to the unpredictable disease course. Those patients at home could be rapidly triaged and escalated back into the hospital where their condition deteriorated. And keeping as many patients self-isolated while being monitored also then minimised potential exposure to others, most notably healthcare workers. Over a thousand COVID-19 patients were managed in Ireland with this solution. Primarily, as mentioned, to discharge patients early, with each patient typically discharged a few days earlier than otherwise possible but it was also used to a lesser degree in hubs where the patients had symptoms but did not meet admission criteria and they could be monitored to ensure they weren't having hypoxia. Around 35% of those patients generated system alerts, indicating the need and clinical utility of the system due to their low blood oxygen levels. In addition, con consultants such as Owen Devara and Bowman have spoken about the immense value in the data generated from this, in helping understand future potential waves of the disease. For many patients who've been successfully discharged, we are learning about the long-term COVID-19 symptom burden. Patients moving from acute to chronic COVID-19. And one of the most concerning areas is around the long-term lung damage and fibrosis associated with COVID pneumonia. We're already helping facilitate post-COVID rehabilitation clinics and pulmonary rehab clinics for other lung disease patients. Pre-COVID, we'd been working with Galway University Hospital Matter and Bowman hospitals on Sloan to care integration projects around care pathway transformation and lung disease. So in Galway Adult Cystic Fibrosis Clinic, for example, they are now seeing their CF patients with vis video visits, along with objective data collected through our platform. This allows them to understand the pulmonary function test data, how well a patient's lungs are performing, their oxygen level and weight, subjective data through a cystic fibrosis quality of life uh, questionnaire, and lifestyle data, such as how active they are, how many steps per day, while also getting medication reminders and educational content, with all of this data relayed back to the clinic in Galway in real time. This reduces the need for the patients to visit the hospital and reduces the need for hospital resources. 
As COVID-19 came under control in May, we've been helping hospitals try to restore normal chronic disease management services, primarily in lung disease. Respiratory illness is an enormous consumer of healthcare resources, accounting for 14% of hospitalizations, 16% of bed days, and the vast majority of these are emergency admissions. Ireland has doubled the OECD average of COPD admissions, and there is significant evidence from other countries that implementing better management programs helps reduce hospitalizations. As we've shown in deployments like in NYU, Langone and New York, managing chronic disease remotely can free up large numbers of routine appointments, capacity which is greatly needed, even more so during this pandemic. Um, but not alone can it free up routine appointments for chronic lung patients. It also has additional benefits, such as earlier detection of complications. And of course, in the current environment, virtual consultations lowers the risk of COVID-19 exposure for those vulnerable patients. We've seen huge demand for our solutions internationally. In the US, we're working with brand name hospitals from coast to coast. And in fact, we're now also deployed with Mount Sinai, who heard about our COVID-19 work with the HSE. And we were part of their COVID-19 discharge and recovery program, and also working with them on other lung disease programs. Mount Sinai are the largest health system in Manhattan. So that was a, a really strategic um, and important um, hospital for us to work with. In the UK, we've also recently won contracts in lung disease with leading hospital trusts, such as Imperial in London and University of Nottingham. And we're looking forward to, to working with many more soon. That's it for me, Martin. So hopefully I've caught up in a little bit of time for you. That was fantastic. And thanks for the great collaboration. And I, I think it just the in the adoption by almost 30 organizations of the, the clinical and the medical device, you absolutely probably accomplish what normally might have taken a year and a half to two years in the space of two to three weeks. Really impressive. So uh, thanks. Thanks for the collaboration. Lorraine, do you want to make a comment before we move on to Martin? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, brilliant. Okay, just a couple of things on that. Um just um we uh, we realized at the start that this would have different, you know, could have different uses. And one of the first things we did uh with Galway University Hospital was to get all of their CF patients monitored on the app. So that was like you know, an eye opener for us that we knew we could use it for C COPD and CF patients. The other thing was um, we got a lot of our staff on it, which was very reassuring for us because some of our staff come from other places and they don't have family units here. So we knew they'd be going home monitored on the app and it gave us a lot of reassurance. And there was actually, I think I, Emma might uh, tell me like if I'm correct, but I think there was 236 um, alerts on on over a thousand patients so that meant that those people if they'd have been at home alone they might not have been recognized to have you know a problem so it works uh just it, it was nice um to, sorry go ahead 35 percent of the patients uh, about had alerts and many patients had multiple alerts so it was you know about 350 patients had you know pretty pretty dangerous desaturation uh, two last things, sorry, I don't want to take up the time, but uh, Anne mentioned how we had to change the way we worked and the forms that we had to get through with the DPIA and stuff like that would normally be done over two, three weeks, a month. But we had um, an expert in Chris Mean, who's the DPO for the OOCIO, and he worked with us and we got that across the board. And one of the unsung heroes in this was uh, Stephen Mulvaney, the chief financial officer, um, when we were trying to get uh, some money released so that we could buy some more of the pulse oximeters and they were actually being caught in America and they were saying they wanted to hold them there. So we needed to release some funds and I went into Stephen Mulvaney who I knew some from doing staff engagement events and just went in and spoke to him I was getting being sent from one place to the other and I just said and I'm going into Stephen and I sat down and explained to him what the situation was and he had it sorted like within a day so like I mean people don't realize you know I know the frontline staff are brilliant 
but it's a well-oiled machine and it's the procurement, it's, you know, it's the financial people, it's everybody, it's the people doing the DPAOs. There was a lot of people involved in this, like, you know, so like we look like, you know, we did it by ourselves, but actually there was, we had like a lot of help from everybody. So I just like to mention them because sometimes they don't get a look in. So like, and I really appreciate what Stephen did. That's a great point, Lorraine. It was great teamwork. So thanks very much, Eamon and Lorraine, for that. Brilliant. Okay. So Gemma Garvin is the CIO at St. James's Hospital. And St. James's were very much sort of at the uh, the vanguard of everything that was going on and responding to COVID-19. And Gemma will talk to you about how St. James has responded to, to the crisis. Over to you, Gemma. Thanks. I just have the opportunity to give you an overview of the COVID response here in St. James's Hospital. And I hope that you'll find, having listened to Anne and Fran and the other speakers before me, that it's very much aligned in terms of what the national response was. But I'll particularly look at the collaborations between uh, St. James's, uh, the HSE and the vendors in terms of providing digital solutions to help manage the pandemic here in St. James's Hospital. So just a quick overview to give you um, some um, touch points around the size and scale of the activity that happens at St. James's Hospital. So we're the largest academic teaching hospital in the country. We have over 25,000 inpatient episodes uh, annually and up to 290,000 outpatient episodes. We also have the busiest ED department in the country with almost 50,000 um, attendances annually. Um, so that's the size and scale of the operations um, that we're, we're dealing with within our acute facility. Um, to just to, to ground where we're coming from, similar to um, the strategy outlined by the Office of CIO within St. James, we have um, our four strategic priorities and our informatics roadmap is very much grounded around ensuring that we can deliver on those. So this gives you some context in terms of what our priorities and our strategies were and how they helped for our response in terms of the, the, the COVID pandemic and the requirements within the hospital. So we look at building strong digital foundations. In St. James, as you'll be aware, that we're the first uh, implementation of electronic patient record system in 2018. And that really stood to us in terms of um, our ability to respond to the pandemic and to have accurate, available, real-time, clinically rich data. Uh, in terms of our foundations for where we, we were starting from. We look at providing hospital management with the data that they need to drive insights, and we have quite a well-developed uh, business intelligence unit within the hospital, and um, similar to the data lake within the office of CIO, we have our data warehouse here, which takes the feeds from the systems, and again, that's critical that that's the focus of the hospital. Uh, again, providing clinicians with um, improved tools to provide their um, their work as effectively and efficiently as possible. But first and foremost, the priority from um, the hospital's perspective and also from an informatics directorate perspective is the patient and improving the patient outcomes and their experience of care in this hospital. So that was the scene in which we looked at um, how we would respond to COVID. And again, this is a quick digital overview to give you an idea of the number of applications in use across the hospital, over 188 applications in use. Um, and also some of the priority programmes that we were working on before the pandemic hit um, in St. James's Hospital. So similar to the timeline that um, Anne O'Connor outlined, it was critical from James's perspective that we had insights uh, in terms of uh, the pandemic and, and its um, route to coming to St. James's um, and what impact it could potentially have on how we could deliver care and our capacity to deliver care um, within this hospital. So while the WHO made their official global pandemic announcement on the 11th of March, well before that, the planning started in the hospital um, in terms of a containment phase and how we would respond to try and ensure that we didn't move into an active management phase of COVID within the hospital. That included analysing data from the WHO to try and predict what the impact would be and to put the required testing in place and to have a look at what kind of capacity we needed uh, in terms of ICU in particular. 
and all the related critical care elements that we need to look at. Uh, we also stood up our informatics response team. And again, that was looking at the priorities that we could identify and how we could start actively working on those um, in anticipation of the uh, global pandemic landing within the Irish context. That all happened in late January, early February. Um, and then we moved into active management within St. James Hospital from the 3rd of March when we had our first um, positive patient admitted. Um, and there were some complexities around that where they had been a previous inpatient the week before. So they came through our ED, but they had been an inpatient. So we had to instigate active contact tracing uh, immediately from the first positive um, COVID case at scale. Um, and we, need, we were in a uh, envious position, I suppose, that we could use our EPR data to try and implement that contact tracing quickly and effectively. And then once the official uh, announcement came from um, the WHO, we could activate our plan. Uh, I'll go through them in I'll go through them in detail um, as much as I can. Obviously, we don't have time to deal with everything that we have to do from a hospital perspective and even from an informatics perspective. But I'll touch on the infrastructure and IT requirements to equip the hospital. I'll specifically look at the application support and the rollout that we have to do, the adoption of new systems. Um, and the modification of our existing system so that we could change how the care was delivered to meet the requirements of the pandemic. Again, talk about us being a data-driven organisation and how we responded um, through the use of our data warehouse and our BI capability. And then looking at the virtual care delivery, how we um, initially responded and what the ongoing planning and enablement is for managing hospital care within the COVID environment. So our priority activities, we talked about patient-centred activities, so protecting our patients in the containment phase. Um, we reduced footfall within the hospital, so patient visiting uh, was restricted from the 10th of March. There were no patients um, allowed to have visitors within the hospital setting, so we immediately had to respond to ensure that we could set up a virtual visiting service for patients. It was a very um, difficult time for patients to be in hospital. Um, and it was a bit, uh, there was a lot of anxiety within patients and their families. So it was really important that we quickly were able to um, set up a virtual visiting service and also then to look at remote outpatients. So reducing um, footfall meant that we need to set up our, um, our remote outpatient consultations and our video consultations. Um, we looked also then at around our surge capacity preparation. So a huge uh, stream of work, particularly for our networks and our child dance team here in James has needs to look at the expansion for the surge capacity. So again, okay. Anne referenced it earlier in terms of what the prediction would be of a surge, and we need to look at how the hospital would manage that. So from uh, late February, we were really looking at how we would expand our ICU capacity within St. James, and that meant that we needed to um, make sure that we could uh, convert existing beds into ICU bed capacity. That looked at network points, it looked at um, even cabling, sockets um, that needs to be implemented because of the huge amount more requirements in terms of um, network connectivity and capability and even power and oxygen um, as we outlined that were required. And we expanded our ICU bed capacity by 100% in St. James Hospital. So very early on, the team had to look at um, working long hours to get that uh, capacity stood up and made available. As part of that, we also had to look at amendments to key systems, like our ICU system needs to be modified and expanded with licenses and capture cards so that we could expand the system. We also had to modify our EPR system, our PAS system, um, to change the bed status in these locations and to convert them um, within the systems from IC, uh, from EPR beds to ICU beds um, and ensure that we can do that safely and effectively within the hospital. I'll touch on the insights, the data-driven response and how we use the data that we had to allow us to make evidence-based decisions across the hospital to respond to the pandemic and what, what was happening on a daily basis in real time within our hospital setting. Uh, and then supporting our staff, looking at how we had to focus on um, providing remote working similar to the HSE. There was a, a volume of over 400 staff that we needed to 
uh, enabled to work remotely and um, remote monitoring. We were one of the ones that used the patient empower. So I'll talk uh, very briefly about that. We also had to set up an occupational health and contact tracing um, system within the hospital to ensure that we could manage that within our hospital environment. And to deal with staff health and well-being, we had to develop an act with our psychological medicine and our occupational health team to ensure that we could look after the staff that were giving everything to the pandemic. So I'll go into the virtual visiting service. Uh, again, this is part of our uh, focus on patient-centric care. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could set everything up so that patients could talk to their families, and it was hugely important. Um, Device selection, we had a, we had to set up initially with devices that we had available and send them out to the to the inpatient areas and make them available for any of the patients that didn't have their own mobile phones that didn't have the ability um, to use the likes of FaceTime or WhatsApp calls with their family. So we did distribute devices out to the wards very early on to make sure that they, they could provide that service. We also worked with our nursing team and our end of life team and our chaplaincy service to provide a virtual a visiting service within the hospital. So this is where we've dedicated team to where you could book a virtual visit um, with a patient and it would be a facilitated visit. The feedback um, from that was really, really positive from the patient and their families, but also from staff because the staff are first hand looking after their patients and they understand the anxiety of um, being in hospital during this very strange time and what was needed was um, the ability to talk to their own family uh, and that was something that needed to be stood up very early on. Um, in terms of the activity and volumes, with, from the facilitated virtual service, we had over 200 calls but there were hundreds of facilitated calls um, locally within the ward that the staff nurses themselves provided the, um, the ability for staff, or for staff members to talk to families and patients to talk to families directly. I'll move on to virtual consultations. Again, the, the critical need for this became very evident early on. We had video and telephone consultations replacing our outpatient care, so reducing the footfall. Um, and this was stood up very early on. Um, we had our first um, video consultation um, from the 5th of March. Um, and we also worked with the HSC to stand up the blue eye um, tool from Redzinc. We had very positive feedback from the staff early on. It was intuitive and early to use, easy to use, and that the, the patients themselves um, were given a link so they could they could um, connect directly. So again, in terms of the volumes, there were over thirty thousand uh, virtual consultations conducted between the fifth. March and the 30th of June. Um, in order for us to roll that out at that scale, we set up the governance committee and we agreed from a hospital level that the ambition was for virtual care. So that was to try and integrate any virtual consultations with their face to face consultations and make sure that the documentation around that consultation was held within one central system. That then meant that EPR modification needed to be made so that the virtual consultations and the clinical records um, could be recorded in our EPR and held with the patient's records. Um, things like the standard operating procedures, the user setup, uh, all of those things had to be taken on board from a small team who, as similar to Fran had outlined, we had to stop doing other things in order to set this up and to focus on the requirements. Um, for virtual consultations, which worked very, very well from the hospital's perspective. The remote home monitoring service, um, gone through in detail with Eamon, uh, just in terms of our adoption in St. James's Hospital, we went live early in Mar um, on the 19th of March. We were one of the first sites to go live with it, to have our agreed SOPs and our processes in place um, to allow patients to be discharged with the remote monitoring tool. Um, and the benefits from the hospital's point of view were a reduction in um, length of stay from the patient's perspective and also that assurance that we weren't people keeping patients in hospital beds in case they saturated, that we could send them home and have that level of assurance and monitoring that we, that we were comfortable, that the patient didn't need to stay in an inpatient bed. 
quick statistics around its use in St. James's. We had over 71 patients on the remote monitoring. Um, the readmission rate was very low, only 4.2%. We had no deaths uh, for anybody that was uh, on the home monitoring. The average length um, of stay in hospital was 1.9 days, so they were discharged with these quite rapidly. Um, we had the average number of phone calls along that COVID pathway was just over one phone call that was required because the alerting gave us that sense of satisfaction. And then the staff on the pathway, we did roll it out to our staff. So any positive staff that were in a high risk category that weren't meeting the admission criteria, we made a decision to offer the, um, the remote monitoring to those staff. Again, to provide them the reassurance to touch on Lorraine's point around you know, the demographics of the staff and the fact that if they were going home uh, COVID positive, that they felt reassured that they were being monitored and somebody was looking after them from a, um, from a health perspective. Data-driven insights, we talked about um, the creation of COVID dashboards was something that we had to stand up very quickly within James to provide the executive team with the oversight and the evidence to make the decisions around how many COVID patients we had, who was awaiting a test back. There was a huge amount of detail that we could pull from systems where we already had the data, but we needed to look and provide the executive with a different view of that data to help us manage in these new circumstances. This um, data also allowed us to create our contact tracing service, um, provided us with insights into our capacity needs. We talked about oxygen usage being a critical factor at one point in terms of their response to COVID. So the, um, the data from our EPR allowed us to drive um, oxygen levels um, and to understand what the oxygen usage was like uh, in real time within the hospital. And that's something that was um, made available as part of our executive dashboards during our planning and our management phases. Um, our COVID occupational health staff and resource management was also uh, critically driven by existing data. So we had to stand up an occupational health dashboard, which gave us oversight of what staff were currently out on contact tracing, what staff were currently out as COVID positive, and critically, when we were expecting them to be back so that we could manage our, um, our resources within the hospital. So this is just a quick overview of what that COVID dashboard looked like. Um, it gave us total numbers, but it also allowed us, and actually off screen here, I can see that you can't see the side sidebar on the on the dashboard, but it gave us critical overviews around the now, who, what patients are positive at the moment, what the demographic is like, what their age profile is like. Um, it also gave us their discharge history, but it, it gave us our ICU capacity, gave us a huge amount of data that helped us to drive how the hospital will operate as part of the um, pandemic response. Another area I'll just touch on quickly is our EPR handover whiteboard. Again, this is a collaborative um, response with um, the HSE uh, and our colleagues in Beaumont um, on how we could use um, our existing EPR data uh, and adopt the CCI index, which is the vital signs algorithm that allowed us to determine the patient's risk levels and present it within our EPR environment so that the medical teams could use it um, for easy handover and effective management of COVID positive patients. And we provided this data set um, to the HSC for critical analysis and research. So that was a collaborative uh, effort between ourselves and the HSC. But again, it, it, it touched on our ability to do that within our EPR environment because we had the data already captured digitally. Um, it was a, a matter of applying the algorithm. So the final area that I'll talk to you about in terms of the response, and as I said, there is a huge amount more that I haven't been able to touch on, but it was around our um, My Staff Space uh, application. So our ability to manage staff uh, during the COVID was an extremely stressful time for staff. Um, and it was something that we wanted to do to, to address their mental health uh, and their psychological well-being was to provide them with a service and relevant data for how they could self-manage and how they could seek help from the hospital in terms of um, their own health and well-being. So we reached out and we worked with um, a local company called My, um, 
my patient space and we developed this my staff space application so we adapt to the platform which was a, a communication and collaboration tool platform that allowed us to meet the needs of the staff that were identified through our occupational health and our psychological medicine service and that was very well adopted and we used our communications team within uh, the hospital to roll that out uh, across the site so finally, uh, in terms of our ongoing, ongoing COVID response, again, some of the things that we need to focus on within St. James's is how we support the transformation of outpatient services now using digital technology. How we adopt and move from our initial response to sustainable um, services, such as our virtual health service um, and our remote working services, and how we can continue to provide data required uh, to support the monitoring uh, of the virus and the infection levels and provide that data back to the executive team. And also, finally, we're going to focus on the effective communication for patients. So looking at developing a tool that will allow us to engage differently with, uh, with patients so that we can long term address the outpatient requirements and that need to have a virtual health um, embedded in care delivery in line with Slauncher Care and one of the big opportunities that come from the management of COVID within St. James's Hospital is that we were, like the others, able to provide um, things that we've been hoping to do for a long time quickly and effectively within, uh, within the hospital during the pandemic and hope we'll be able to sustain those. Great. Thanks very much, Gemma. That was a really impressive uh, presentation and uh, you were so quick off the the mark and there's several things that you've talked about that definitely can be reapplied across the broader HSE uh, network, uh, not least uh, the My Staff Space uh, app, which I think there's a real opportunity for deploying that nationally. Now we rejig the agenda just we are running over time and uh, with Miles Murray we've agreed that we'll move his presentation to the next Digital Academy Forum. Uh, Ross has worked closely with Martin uh, down there and I think now Martin is is ready to present. So Martin again was one of the um, HSE leaders who was very visible and um, it was a, you know, in the very early days of the crisis. Martin worked with uh, interpreting the Late Late Show to demonstrate or to talk about what people could expect when they went to a COVID-19 uh, testing centre. So over to you Martin and we'll, we'll learn about the uh, National Ambulance Service response to COVID-19. Yeah, thanks very much Martin and thanks very much Janet for, for Having me out there with a little bit of nice and sweet bitch. Can you hear me now? No, there's still a lot of feedback. If it's okay, Martin, what we might do is um take take the take your call off uh, for a second and we get the next presenter lined up and we'll try and fix the uh, the audio issue if that's okay. No, go ahead. Sorry about So apologies everyone for the technical difficulties. We will have our next uh, speaker now. So I'm just uh, queuing that up. Who we have next is John Moore. John, John, are you okay to uh, start presenting? I uh, sure am. Yeah. Excellent, great. We just, uh, I just give you access here now. And uh, share my screen. Screen one. Yeah, just loading now. Awesome. Um, hi everybody. Uh, so. Um, so I come from a company called S3 Connected Health and uh, S3 Connected Health is actually quite an aged organization which has been around since about 1986. Uh, we're currently about 200 people. We specialize now in connected health or in digital health uh, applications. And typically we work with um, med tech providers, uh, pharma companies and with uh, uh, healthcare providers uh, to deliver uh, digital health services, um, you know, for uh, connected health purposes for uh, uh, digital therapeutics and so on. Uh, we do most of our business um, in, uh, in in export markets. We've deployed services in about 50 different countries uh, and across about 20 different therapeutic areas. And we've overall, we've delivered about uh, 20 um, uh, certified medical devices. So I guess it was in that context that actually we got a call on the night of the 20, uh, 14th of March um, from we got actually two calls on the night of the 14th of March to say, hey guys, uh, you, you know, we are looking at this, uh, at the issues that people are having over in Italy uh, and uh, we're really keen to maybe 
get you in so that we can talk about how we can uh, mitigate some of the, the, the risks that we see down the line. Uh, the callers were um, a couple of people. Uh, the, there was a man called Oren uh, Rigby from uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, and the other one was uh, Richard Costello from Beaumont Hospital. Uh, and we were eventually brought into a smoke filled room. Um, well, actually, it wasn't smoke filled because there were obviously respiratory collisions. Um, but uh, uh, the there was a gathering of maybe fourteen or fifteen clinicians on the uh, on 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 the, on the Sunday, the fifteenth of uh, of uh, March, um, where essentially they articulated uh, their fears for uh, for for what was coming down the line. And you know, people have become quite blasé about uh, about COVID in some in some cases. Um, but back in on the fifteenth of March, uh, this really did feel like there was a, a train heading down the tracks and we were tied to it. Um, so, so the clinicians were justifiably uh, very concerned and they were looking at the systems that they had to hand in the hospitals and how they could uh, scale uh, the, 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 the delivery of care uh, within the hospitals. And one of the things that they were looking at was the fact that um, they were going to run out of respiratory staff, uh, specialist respiratory uh, care staff, both in terms of clinicians and in terms of nurses and so on and so forth. And that what would happen was that they would have inexperienced people coming into the uh, uh, to, to look after people in respiratory dis distress, and they needed a way to uh, guide them in terms of uh, how to provide care. Uh, they needed a common way to assess those patients, to manage those patients, to communicate about those patients. Uh, and after about you know two and a half, three hours of, 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 uh, of us as being complete outsiders scratching our heads as to what these doctors were talking about. It became clear actually that what they were designing was that they were designing a uh, clinical triage score. Uh, and uh, they, they designed, or uh, we, we eventually, the output of that would be the, the CCCI index. Uh, and over the next two weeks, we designed a service called Accord um, which, uh, which which looked to address those challenges. So th the needs, as I said, were to to assess, manage, and communicate the status of patients to enable them to prioritise those patients, uh, so that the uh, patients most in need would get the uh, would, would get the care that uh, was required, um, and also the ability to support uh, inexperienced patients um, with uh, managing. Um, uh, patients with, 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 with respiratory problems. Uh, so because actually of that particular requirement, because of the need to give advice to clinicians, actually this became a, a medical device. Um, and for those of you, and I'm sure there's a few of the, you there in the audience who have de delivered medical devices, um, that makes the bar about five times higher um, than it would normally or necessarily uh, be otherwise. But, you know, at the time we were, uh, I suppose a little bit naive and a little bit, uh, uh, you know, very well disposed towards trying to help these clinicians out. So we said yes, uh, and our team um, worked really, really hard to uh, deliver a service, and they delivered a service to Beaumont Hospital in less than two weeks, right, um, from scratch. Uh, and what that service was was a clinical tool uh, for uh, the respiratory care of uh, of, of uh, COVID nineteen patients. It was um, a class one medical device uh, and it could be deployed to hospitals within a couple of days. So very little training involved. Uh, the user interface was really, really simple. A lot of the feedback that we had uh, was very positive as regards usability. Uh, we used a simple traffic light model to indicate you know, what the uh, level of risk for a, a, a particular patient was. Um, and uh, as I said, it was built on, on, on this idea of a, a COVID care index where Clinicians could then see the um, trajectory of a patient over time, and that trajectory was predictive of whether they would end up in, um, in intensive care, or indeed whether uh, they would uh, they would succumb to the disease and pass away. So it was a very very strong uh, uh, planning tool as well as being an operational tool. Um, the index itself was designed collaboratively, you know, with uh, with with the uh, clinicians and refined actually over two iterations, well, probably over about 10 iterations, but, but mainly over two iterations. Um, so uh, really what, what, what happened here was that there was a very strong um, uh, 
collaboration between technical people and, and, and clinical experts who were really strongly motivated to solve a problem. And actually that motivation was really uh, uh, enabled us to do things very, very quickly that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. And indeed that collaboration expand, expanded even further, you know, when we started talking about uh, uh, data protection agreements and, 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 and uh, bed planning and all of that sort of stuff, everybody was very uh, well disposed towards getting a service uh, up and running very, very quickly. Um, the index itself is reasonably straightforward. Uh, it, um, uh, it needed to be modified on a couple of occasions um, just to tweak it so that we could actually use the data as feedback. So we, we, we deployed the, the service as a, as a pilot. We then uh, ran people through the, uh, the, the service, did some modeling, and then uh, modified the, uh, the, the, the scoring mechanism. Um, it was found to be a strong, strong predictor of um, of, of disease progression um, and death, stronger than existing uh, scores like uh, the ROX index, which is used for respiratory uh, conditions, or NEWS, which is used for uh, early warning scores. Apologies for the background noise. My neighbour has literally started drilling as 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 I got on the call. <laughs> so, uh, such as such as life and such as luck. Um, okay, so we were able, using Accord, to uh, look at the needs for the requirements for beds um, uh, within the within the hospital system. We were also able to uh, look at the uh, requirement for oxygen uh, and ensure that actually uh, contribute data, which enabled the hospitals to make sure that they had enough uh, uh, oxygen uh, to manage the patients uh, in their care. Um, we were also providing a lot of efficiency for uh, the uh, clinicians, for the respiratory clinicians, so that the really senior guys, the consultant clinicians at the top um, of the, the hierarchy, they were able to have an overview of the pa patient population in their care, and they were able to uh, intervene, you know, where necessary, where, where, where patients were uh, heading in the wrong direction. On the other end of the scale, they were able to assign, you know, to less experienced or perhaps even non-specialist clinicians, uh, th those patients who were stable, um, but who also uh, were, were, were under their care. Uh, so this enabled them to scale the, the delivery of, 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 of care for the period of the, the peak. Uh, overall, we had about uh, 2,300 patients uh, registered on the system. Um, we had, uh, we deployed the service in six different hospitals. I think in one of the slides it mentioned that uh, we had been approved for a national rollout and uh, uh, we were ready to do that. Um, uh, and then the numbers of patients who were uh, contracting the disease uh, thankfully received it. Uh, so, the, so the national rollout actually uh, hasn't happened. But we're still operating in, in, in six hospitals and we're ready to scale up if, uh, if the need occurs uh, in the future. Um, I won't go through this because I've probably gone through it already um, in, in, in many ways. Uh, it is a class one medical device. We actually, within the, uh, the, the uh, within six weeks of actually uh, deploying it under derogation um, uh, from the HPRA, uh, we CE marked it um, so that uh, it, it can be used in, in other countries also. Um, we built the uh, service up on top of our Affineal platform, which is a secure platform, which really gave us a lot of uh, um, gave us a lot of capabilities and it enabled us to to uh, build the service very very quickly uh, and to do it in a very secure and GDPR compliant way. Uh, so, in terms of the challenges and lessons learned, um, I guess uh, you know it really was a hot house. Uh, we had. Um, we had uh, very early and intense engagement with clinicians and other stakeholders. So I would say um, in those first three or four days, um, you know, I got to know Richard Costello really, really well. Um, we uh, must have spent uh, 24 hours together in that, in, in, in that period of time. Um, and we developed a, a really good understanding and we also developed a, an understanding that if we were going to achieve this and we we're going to have to achieve it uh, based on doing the least amount that we could possibly do in order to be effective to be impactful so we had a br brutally uh, focus on on simplicity and on the potential impact of the, the features that we were adding uh, 
Uh, we also did it in an iterative way. Um, so we, we adopted uh, some design thinking techniques so that we were actually uh, solving problems. We were prototyping those problems and then we were uh, uh, showing them back to the uh, clinicians to ensure that uh, the, the implementation was what they expected and so that they could refine our implementations. Uh, and that worked really, really well. And obviously, you know, we, we got a lot of clinician time in order to, to do this. Um, we, so we, we accept John, if we probably need to wrap in about a minute just to. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, so, in terms of the regulatory process, um, uh, we did ISO uh, 6304 at speed. Um, and uh, like I said, in about seven and a half weeks, we got to from, from a first contact with the HSC or with the uh, clinicians to a CE uh, marked class one uh, device. Uh, I suppose w one of the things just in the HSC context that that's interesting is that one of the problems that we ran into was the, uh, the, the individual data privacy agreements uh, or assessments across Irish hospitals. So with the HSC hospitals, what you can do is you can actually uh, work with the HSC and get a single agreement in place. But obviously, if you're working with any of the voluntary hospitals, uh, you need different agreements and that adds a lot of complexity. Uh, so look out for that one. I think the other thing that was that we were a cloud-based service and I think, you know, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of experience in terms of uh, building or, or uh, handling the procurement of some uh, cloud-based cloud services uh, uh, across the board. Uh, so we were, we were pioneering, I think, in some, in some ways. Uh, that's it. If anybody has any questions, please feel to reach out or feel free to reach out. Uh, happy to answer or engage with you in any way. Brilliant, John. And just to acknowledge S3, we're a fantastic partner and we were all learning together and we now have a system. If we get hit by a second wave, that will really help us uh, respond. Now, we've had about 160 people join the webcast. Uh, we are going to run over. As I said, we've modified the agenda and Miles will present at our next staff. Uh, we have two remaining speakers for the people that need to drop off. Thank you for attending. Um, hopefully, some will have the uh, will have the possibility of staying on, and we'll go next to uh, Martin Dunn, who's the director of National Ambulance Service. And I think we have the sound problem uh, sorted out. Martin, can you hear us? I can, Ross. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. A Excellent. So yeah. I'm just going to do the driving here, just to uh, someone has that, and we're going to. Uh, Back to pick back up where we left off, which is this one. Yeah, and I and I just I just like to say thanks very much, Ross, for the ICT support. And I know I've taxed you to the last so far today, and I can say that you're quite resilient. In fairness, here. thanks a million. And I'm <laughs> my and John, my two front subs that have took over the night. So thanks very much. And I'm conscious of the time, so I, I'll move on. As I was just saying earlier on, I suppose some of the, the stats that are on the screen in front of us, they're very important in relation to the National Ambulance Services platform because everything that you, you see on the screen in front. Way, shape, or another, used during the COVID 19 and it still continues to be used and will be used as we move through this COVID pandemic. So, I suppose we've, two, we've over 2,000 staff. Uh, we also have a two sites uh, if, for a control center offering on one singular national digital platform which accommodates both voice and data. So, that has been allowing us to build a common digital workplace. Uh, with cloud adaptation, as Fran referred to earlier on, which was of great assistance to moved on through the covert uh, requirements. We have 102 ambulance stations based across the country, jotted around. So our requirement for communications is uh, very high and it has to be clear and concise at all times as we operate a fleet of 500 vehicles uh, on a daily basis. As I said, we have a financial envelope around 200 million. And again, I keep contesting it's not near enough, but other people disagree with me, but that's fine too. And we do 320,000 ambulance calls per annum, which results in roughly 12,000, 1,000 calls a day. And again, that's another important thing to remember as part of the COVID response, because whilst we were dealing with everything else and everyone else, we still had to respond to the ongoing everyday ambulance calls, which were at the time up to around 600 to 700 a day, and have now come back up to 1,200 a day. And last year alone, we, we, we covered over 22 million kilometres by road. So I suppose just quickly where, where we came from, I'll go through really quickly, where we are now and where we're going to go to. So we can run us to the next slide. And, and the next one as well. Um, and I suppose, as referred to both by Anne, Martin, and Fran, one of the most important things for the National and Ambulance Service in everything that we do, the patient comes for. And we just use a simple mnemonic called eye care, and that's embedded in every every part of the service to make sure that everything that we're doing 
uh, COVID or non-COVID, adds value to the patient's outcome and to the patient's time to protect the ambulance to the system, and that's hugely important to us. So Sorry to interrupt, you, Martin, very quickly. Uh, can you just pull your mic piece just a bit away from your mouth? Or just get a bit Did I get this right, Chad, Ross? Yeah, just another bit. Yes, thank you. Okay, next one. We're on the historical perspective. Uh, and I suppose just for clarity, uh, I'd like to confirm too that I am not in either of those pictures, even though so during some of the induction courses we run for new staff coming on, they seem to look at me in such a way that they think I should be, but I'm not. So that was predominantly a transport service, and we were looked at across the years as a transport service. So as we move into the next slide, uh, we can see to where we've changed into a full clinically driven service. Uh, and it's important maybe to look at the centre photograph of that, because that will be shown on the last slide. That's the old way of working in relation to how we manage patients. And all the other mechanisms around that are the units that we use to be able to deliver pre hospital both on ground assets and air assets. And every part of that had to be looked at from a digital point of view uh, as part of the delivery of the service going forward through the COVID-19. Go ahead, Ross. As I said, we have 102 stations right across the country in three operational areas, which is the West, North, Leinster and the South, as you can see. But we also have uh, areas of support, which are, go ahead, Ross, to support these areas, which is the National Control Centre, we call NEOC, which is the National Emergency Operations Centre. And as I already said, there's two, two sites operating on a common singular uh, digital platform, uh, one located in Tala and one located in Ballyshannon. So 99912 calls for Ireland with exceptional double city go into those buildings and we utilise a digital system uh, to, to take the calls. We also support it from the training and, and educational point of view. So we have a training college and we're amalgamated with UCC in Cork in, in digital in Tala. And again, we're using virtual reality training now. We're using digitally enabled mannequins, uh, low, high, and medium fidelity mannequins. And we also have a fully digitally controlled system in the middle and the bottom. And it's very important for us to understand that new staff uh, that are coming into us on a, on, a, on a continuous basis are very, I suppose, uh, ICT focused. Uh, and we have to be, make sure that whatever we do them to allow what they're comfortable with in this world, not like the good old days when I started. So again, just where we are now with the minute, Ross, uh, I'm going through this fairly fast. We have a, we're a, what you call a credit the center of excellence uh, for what we do in call taking and dispatch. We were the first country in the world to get it. We have our ISO 9000s uh, in relation to process and procedure. Every vehicle in Ireland, every ambulance vehicle in Ireland has solar powered with, uh, as you can see, uh, an award there from Seal Ireland. And we use uh, the solar powered EAs uh, via the solar panels on the roofs of the vehicles to, to assist with uh, our green footprint and carbon reduction. Um, as a, on the next slide, we have two sites. They're all digitally, digitally linked, and we also have a, a digital via call taken system. So anywhere in Ireland, you dial 11299 and ask for an ambulance. The system itself, digitally itself, locates the most rested call taker from the previous call, so there's no manual intervention and the call is popped automatically into that call taker's ear, and they go on with that. We have live dashboards, which we'll come to in a few minutes, and we have a COVID live, which you had to build. And a good thing for Ireland, just before the COVID response, it's good to know for everyone that we have the highest rate of bystander CPR in the patient, for patients in the whole world at 84%, which is a credit to the country. And we operate with the youngest fleet of emergency ambulances in uh, Europe. Next slide, Ross. And again, these, these are quite important in relation to how we interfaced all of these and interacted with all of these through the COVID response, and we're using them every day of the week. So we're lucky enough to have what we call a fully ambulance. Each emergency ambulance at the moment has two Wi-Fi hubs. That allows it to do telemetry, 12 lead telemetry into receiving hospitals for PCI labs, etc. We can do two telemedicine streaming. We have EPCR, electronic patient reporting systems. Each vehicle has a terminal printer to allow printout. We do what you call mobile data systems, and I'll come to them in more detail. And as I said already, we have full digital radio and data in every vehicle. Uh, we have also in the making a full emergency, electrical emergency ambulance. So some of the in-vehicle stuff that Ross has put up on the screen, if you just touch it again, Ross, two, two or three more things will pop in. So from a delivery point of view, all you can see in front of you are digitally enabled. The in, and someone mentioned oxygen there lately. So we have a, a digitally enabled in-gas monitoring system which flags to the attendants in the back of the vehicle as to when an oxygen cylinder should be changed, and it automatically changes it up. And there's no manual intervention until you have to change the second cylinder. Uh, 
We have in command systems, which are again digitally focused to allow us to select 999 and, and all the various types that we need to do with blue light responses, energized heaters, energized uh, fishing units, etc. Uh, we have a very sophisticated camera system. And as I said, two Wi Fi hubs in every vehicle. We have the EPCR in the top right hand corner with the digital terminal printer. The, the photograph in the center shows digital radio systems with the MDT, which turns into a navigation tool as well when they accept the call. And it also shows on the other side, we show the, it shows the DFib and the telemetry systems that are in every vehicle. So go ahead there, Ross. And just maybe keep pressing them there. All of these talk to each other, which is very important. Um, the control center is the one in the, in the center slide left. It sends all the NESHA data from the call to the, to the EPC, to the MDT, to the mobile digital handset, used to be called walkie-talkie, um, and also to the defibrillators and the Lucas device that we carry on the machine. And these all talk to each other at all times with all the patient's detail. We were, I suppose, lucky enough to have huge support from HSE ICT and through Martin as well to allow us to get this achieved. We also deliver, developed dashboards and uh, keep going, Ross, there. And I'm conscious of the time. The one on the right is specifically a COVID-19 dashboard. As you can see, it has several tabs on it. And that was one of the first things we did, we decided that we definitely need to deliver on as we entered into the COVID world. And that commenced in March uh, of this year. And it's fully functional with 17 tabs on it to allow us to, to look at all the hotspots, where the calls are, and what we were responding to from a COVID world. And on the left and underneath that is normal everyday responses and performance management and measurement uh, and activity across hospital sites. And each and every one of those are digitally linked down as far as the ambulance officers' telephones, etc., so they can see it on the iPhones that they have. So that's where we are at the moment. And again, it's all been a team effort in fairness from HSE, ICT, Mart, and everyone supporting us to get there. So next slide shows you where we're going at the moment, the future for us. And I suppose the most important thing about it is too that um, Going through the future, as I, as I referenced earlier on, both from ICT and equipment point of view, but also from a personnel, people point of view, uh, digital integration is, is huge uh, and it's required uh, and it's neat, and we have to work with that to make sure that, a, that staff have the necessary tools through a digital interface, patients get the, the best that we can give uh, when we are there to help them out. And it helps us align with the likes of Slaunch Care and the Trauma System world as well. So we have a digital workplace at the moment and we have a cloud which allows us to match it all. So where are we going? Uh, thanks to Martin and his team. Next one, Ross. We have actually now got an innovation portfolio management charter, which allows us to, I suppose, list all the ideas that we're going forward and how we're going to innovate, make them operational as part of everyday work. So that's ongoing at the moment. We've got great support from Martin and his team on that. Thanks. We have our own strategic plan. It's there in the top right corner. And we also have a digital plan, which allows us to dovetail in to the strategic as one of the enabling plans. Um, and allows us to move forward from a digital world. Go ahead. Um, as I said to you earlier on, go ahead, Ross. We we would have been generally looked at as an emergency medical service. You hear the term an EMS system. Uh, we're moving across what you call a, an MMS system, which is a mobile medical system, which is allowing us to integrate with the patient at a much earlier stage and deliver care closer to home, whilst parallel dealing with the high end trauma and serious medical incidents that do occur. It's also allowing us to educate the staff to go from what we would call standard operating procedures and clinical practice guidelines to autonomous practitioners. But it's hugely important to be an autonomous practitioner that the toolbox that you have can react in the way that you need to do it on the front line and make decisions based on data that's coming through, both historical data from the patient's point of view, but also from new data that you're taking from the patient and allows you to make an informed decision about appropriate treatment pathway or care pathway that should be developed for that patient. Okay, Ross. This is, the next slide is very busy, and I just I, I just wanted to say that these are the actual systems that are used at the moment, and they are all going through the whole, as you can see, and they all play a huge, serious and uh, solid part in relation to care delivery. There's a lot on the slide. Top end of it is in relation to dealing with patients dialing one one two nine nine nine, looking for assistance. The middle is dealing with the equipment in the vehicle that allow us to deliver the care, and also to monitor the patient. And as I said, each and every one of them pieces of equipment talks to the other so it's end to end and in the red box there what we're doing for the future is and alluded to it as well but telemedicine we're expanding telemedicine into the control room where there is i think it's they call it patient facing video connection for the doctors in the clinical hub they can actually see and talk to the patient in real time and 
are introducing ultrasounds into the vehicle so we can take an ultrasound in the back of the vehicle part of the trauma system again that's going to have to interface into the patient hub in relation to the the uh, electronic data we're gathering from a clinical point of view um, patient facing video link in the front of ambulances patients have also said to us in the many a time it'd be good to know or see you before we arrived so what we're trying to do this year as well as part of the development is that the paramedic uh, who's not driving naturally enough they, as the attendant, can actually dial back into the patient after they finish with the control room and they can see them and talk to them and let them know they're on the way and develop a bit of a rapport with the caller or the patient before they get there. And hopefully that will give the patient a level of comfort that there is help actually on the way and they can see the human being. Sorry, go ahead there, Ross. I'm going through this very quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, again, there, that's a quick list of the that we're using that has to integrate into everything that we do through the cloud to allow us to deliver what we talked about and all the various parts of it. So we have high-end AMPDS systems which are advanced medical priority dispatch systems that allow us to do high-level triage and calls. We have a low code system which the do doctors operate which is a secondary triage. We have three ways of finding a patient. We use air code which is point of view excellent and that allows us to be able to see a static site or a static building or an address and that automatically then maps on the MDT that I talked about earlier on the direction from where that vehicle is the direction to get to that house uh, to deliver care. We have a thing called Lock 8 which we utilize to find things like wind turbines, uh, buoys on the side of the canals or on the rivers they all have numbers on them and some of the small bridges so give us a number of a wind uh, 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 one of the wind farms or one of the uh, number off one of the buoys on the side of the river we can find that within five meters on the system and then plot a map to it for the responding we also have a thing that was the howard johnson the hse which is find my find my location and we can send a, a, a text from the control system to somebody's phone and if they accept it it sends back the lat long so we can actually identify exactly where lat long as well that allows us to do it on the other side of that you can see the cad systems the integrated command and control systems that are all linked electronic patient care reporting and all the various tools and equipment that we're using uh, and again as i said it's all linked and people are very supportive of this i think that allows us to be able to develop and start and delivering a, a high-end service go ahead ross i mean people say to us well, what's, what what like i mean wh why would you do all this what, what are you getting out of it you go to plan well if you go back to the use of the information never mind alone we're getting real-time information in a lot of cases and we're using it very positively uh, and allowing us to measure our standards and check against our own standards. How we are changing the delivery of care, as I said, from an EMS to an MMS, because sometimes where you're not actually doing what you think you're doing and you might be doing something different altogether. Uh, and uh, we also know for a fact that presentations from a clinical point to the patients we do are changing drastically. We talk about trauma on one side, we know that's reducing, but also lifestyle issues are now I suppose presenting uh, and mental health issues are presenting for well, a lot of what we're dealing with and we need to adjust our equipment but we're able to find that from the information that's coming back through the EPCR, MDT and other systems we're using. We can do clinical audit very quickly, we can assess our clinical KPIs but we can also as part of service requirements and again Anne was talking to them earlier on in the way forward it also allows us to build a very good case and business cases to be able to look, look for the appropriate funding for what we're doing. So that's a lot of very useful information that we're getting from the talks to each other. Go ahead, Ross. Now, I suppose during the COVID-19 and, and I suppose some of the specific things that we were doing, um, and Martin referred to it here, and one of the first things we did was on the bottom right-hand corner was we had to build a control centre to handle COVID-19 requirements. Because as Fran and others alluded to, the activity in around COVID-19 was quite serious and quite heavy. And we had to take the work from the normal command and control center that we talked about earlier on to allow them to, to, to focus on their work and have somewhere else that this can digitally interface with HealthLink and with HSE SwiftQ and, and as well as manage all the responding resources. And as you can see from the photograph in the bottom right, it was a multidisciplinary team. And we were able to utilize our, our colleagues in the military, Garda Shikana, there was actually dental nurses there and other, other people from other areas of HSE that were help us out and sit in and use the digital systems which was a great help we also had to design specific response vehicles which for a particular type of testing we were doing and the swab testing that we were doing both in the in people's homes also in the likes of the nursing homes and residential care settings and we needed specific types of equipment in particular in relation to infection control so we had to design particular vehicles with that in mind 
each of those vehicles also had to have the MDTs, um, electronic report, report uh, systems put in, the digital printers put in as well, and they were all done in less than two weeks. So as someone said earlier on, it's amazing what people can do when we have to do it. During the course of the two, then we had to look at from a, an infection point of view, and um, we were doing what they call a focused patient uh, assessment. And one of the first things we had to do was take a temperature. And in fairness to Martin, he came across this infra infrared digital thermometer, which was used immediately by the National Ambulance Service staff with great success. That also allowed us to upgrade that uh, in, in consultation with Martin and actually some of our colleagues over in China, in Wuhan in China from the ambulance services over there, they went a step further. So the one in the middle there is the latest version of that, which is the digital uh, thermometer, but it also has SpO2 on it, which is the oxygen saturation of the blood. It also takes a heart rate, it also takes a pulse, and it also has an adult BP integrated into it, all on that one piece of the device, lanyard that you can actually hang around the patient's neck and see it and look at it without barely touching the patient at all. And we have them in all responding vehicles now as well, and it's a, it's a very impressive piece of equipment. It allowed us also to upgrade our telemedicine system. On the left, that's Richard having a talk with somebody there, one of our managers, and to allow us to talk into the EDs, particularly in the Dublin area and the Cork area, and maybe work out alternative pathways or let them know how serious the patient is, and also they're receiving consulting and talk to the patient. And again, during the course of the, the, the uh, pandemic, as part of our, our normal vehicle replacement policy, uh, we introduced new vehicles, paramedic units, with sepsis on the side, and because we were conscious of as normal was still going on. Uh, one, of the, one of the main areas that have identified a concern is in relation to people identifying that they're aptic septic. So we have said that the sepsis mnemonic on the side there of the vehicles is now to help. Each and every one of them is a fully build with all the necessary equipment in, as I talked about earlier on. And we're also very conscious of the cyber, cyber security requirements around that because they're an essential service and everything has to be make sure that it's firewalled and locked and safe for use and encrypt it, and that's all done. Um, both the thermometers allowed us, to, in relation to IPC, one wipe with any of the uh, decontam decontamination wipes leaves that thermometer ready to use in the next patient and safe. It also protects the staff, very little contact with the patient. We didn't have to carry a DFIM into the house or a stethoscope or anything else. The piece in the middle could do all that for us. And I'd say thanks to Martin's team for coming across those. Uh, we did start on the, on the 4th of March, 2020. Um, and there was a lot of, as Anne alluded earlier on, ourselves and community uh, were charged to do a lot of testing in, in, a, in a very quick way. And we also had to link in, as I said, with HealthLink to make sure that the dash were required were able to get the, the appropriate information back from the contact tracing point of view. Um, and a lot of other initiatives that went on, I suppose, that really we, we talked about the dashboards and we talked about monitoring staff, staff well-being, etc. A lot of good, hard work done with people. Anyway, go ahead, Ross, and I'm conscious of the time there, so I said I'd try and finish around four for you. Um, and most of all, I think through the middle of all this, I think, to be honest with you, we made some great friends. And uh, I suppose if if you go back, if you didn't go back, Ross, but if you go back to the four, one of the first slides that talked about the patient being centered and where you've seen two paramedics kneeling beside a patient with their arm around an elderly patient talking to them, that was the working. This is now two paramedics dealing with a patient that just brought in with the thumbs up in the new way of working. And in a lot of the ambulance cases that we're responding to now, that's what the patient sees. The, the people on the left and the right, naturally enough, with the ambulance crew, the person in the middle is the patient. But that's the type of difference in the new way of working that we have to be ready for. And the equipment we have has to be able to match in with that. You can see where we linked in with our military. Uh, someone mentioned the ships. Uh, I think it was Fran talked about the, the printers and all that crack and the, and the of both uh, the ships down in Dublin and in Cork. We were very much involved in that as well. And our military, our military uh, colleagues were of great assistance there. Uh, again, in we put in the bottom right-hand corners from one of our drones taken outside CUH, where a lot of staff from CUH were able to to come out and help us do the swabbing. And the one the top right is an interesting one. It's social distancing is from our colleagues in Italy, Lombardy in Italy, who are very very COVID-19 at the start. We've had some very good connections with them, and they sent across the social distancing and the two badges actually to us to try and keep us safe from the experience they were having over there. Which uh, in one which is, is is we were very impressed with and, and we thank them very much for it. Uh, just a little dog on the left just happened to stroll in one day when one of the crews was doing a swabbing exercise in the house just to check out to see how things were going, and we made friends with that. And the the the, the horse was also keeping an eye on uh, swabbing as we were doing in an area down the country one day and was very interested in what was going on. I think he became one of our friends as well to be honest with you. And um, so look at on top of all that, let's be honest with this is all about teamwork. 
but it's all about people working together. I think everything that, that everyone has said so far today um, shows that I suppose either to save a life or to improve an outcome, you need a system, but you also need a team to run the system. And the teams that the National Ambulance Service has dealt with since the end of February of 2020 to date and everything that we've asked for has been outstanding. And I think people should recognise that, whether it's from ICT or whether it's from market from innovation, whether it's from community, military, it didn't make a difference. Dental nurses we had out at one stage with us too. Everybody put their shoulder to the wheel and helped us deliver what we did. And I'd just like to say thanks very much. And I hope that gives a little bit of an oversight of what we're doing in the ambulance service, but we're not finished yet and we have to keep going. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Martin. That Gosh, you crammed about two hours worth of material, 20 minutes, but really impressive. And the National Ambulance Service were very much you're one of the most publicly facing uh, parts of, of the HSC and I know you were on the front line uh, I know yourself personally were on the on the front line so thank you from all of us to the to you and the National Ambulance Service for for all that you've done and you've certainly you know I think you've got the youngest ambulance fleet in Europe uh, and your real adoption the integration or the adoption of that new integrated device in the back of the, the ambulance, which you cost 800 euros and replace a device that costs 25K, it really shows how you're, uh, you know, being very much, you have a, a great positive posture towards uh, the use of, of, of digital. So thanks again, Martin, and apologies that we had the technical difficulties earlier. Uh, can I thank uh, uh, Ross particularly for his direction of this event? Uh, he did a fantastic uh, job keeping us uh, um, going and uh, on track as much as possible. Uh, Sonia Neary from Manola has kindly agreed that we will move our presentation to the next summer staff. And based on the texts and the comments that we're getting, uh, people really enjoy the, uh, the, the, the DAF and are looking forward to the next one. So uh, can I thank our speakers, uh, Anne O'Connor, Fran Thompson, Eamon Costello, Martin Dunn, Gemma Garvin and John Wong. And thank you, the audience, particularly for staying with us, and particularly since we, we ran over 25 minutes. So uh, look forward to talking uh, to you all soon, and uh, let's keep up the great teamwork. Well done, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, guys. Bye.